Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Eilber, for a very informative talk. Um, batting cleanup uh, today for uh, the first day of the conference is uh, Dr. Pisegna. He is uh, currently the chief of GI at the uh, Los Angeles VA Hospital. Um, his real academic passion, though, is neuroendocrine tumors, as well as several uh, other metabolic processes. Uh, he was the first to characterize the gastrin receptor. Uh, and in, in addition to his work on neuroendocrine tumors, which he'll be discussing today, uh, he has a special interest uh, in, as I said, several metabolic processes that are both related and unrelated uh, to gastrin. So again, the final lecture of today to be followed by a brief uh, question and answer session. Uh, Dr. Pesegna uh, will be discussing neuroendocrine tumors. Thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, your attention. It's it's tough being the last uh, uh, lecture in the in the session. Uh, I'm going to try to initially just summarize some information that I presented in a lot of detail last year, and so I thought I would focus most of my time on uh, the uh, case uh, reports, if you will, of patients with neuroendocrine tumors, which is shifting gears a little bit from stromal tumors. And, uh, but we do see a, a fair number of these neuroendocrine tumors in practice. There we go, got it. So just uh, by way of just introduction in terms of the, ep uh, the epidemiology of neuroendocrine tumors, the, the actual incidence uh, that's observed has increased significantly over time. And this is looking at the SEER database, and you can see that the number of uh, carcinoids in this series has increased significantly which is consistent with the practice that we've uh, been having at UCLA in terms of the number of referrals. Uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail because I covered this uh, in a, fair deal, uh, in a fair, um, uh, fairly sort of complex way last year. But uh, just to summarize, for neuroendocrine tumors, the uh, WHO classification for these tumors is uh, based on a class one, class two, or class three. Uh, the class one tumors uh, are grade one, and uh, the index that we use is the KI-67 index, and you can see that that index should be less than 2%. In the moderate grade or grade twos, we typically see a KI-67 index between 3 and 20. The class three neuroendocrine tumors I'm not going to talk about today. These actually behave much more aggressively, uh, more so like small cell carcinomas, uh, I typically don't uh, manage those in my practice. Uh, those should all be really managed with an oncologist uh, with experience in those tumors. They're quite aggressive, and they don't uh, behave similar to the type 1 or type 2s. Uh, if you happen to find a carcinoid on one of your endoscopic biopsies, the pathologist is likely to report a chromogranin A staining, or CGA, or a neuron-specific enolase staining. Uh, in addition to that, if it's not being done for you, you should also insist on a KI-67 or an evaluation of the mitotic index. So this is the uh, diagnostic algorithm for the management of neuroendocrine tumors. We covered this a lot last year. The thing that's changed this year, and I've, I'm going to show some slides related to some cases, is the development of the gallium PET CT68 dotatate, uh, which we now have at UCLA. There, I think Stanford will get it fairly soon. Uh, the uh, uh, Vanderbilt University is also uh, one of the centers in the country that's testing it. But it's now positioned as really the best diagnostic imaging modality for identifying the primary and metastatic tumors. The other uh, aspects of the management have pretty much remained the same. So just uh, gastrocarcinoid tumors are ones that are, I get a f referred to me a fair amount of, uh, in practice. And I just wanted to just summarize the, the ones that you're more likely to see in practice are going to be your type 1s, which are the chronic atrophic gastritis-related patients with pernicious anemia. These patients will typically have very small carcinoids, which you'll find, uh, incidentally, uh, when you perform your endoscopies. The type 2s, I tend to see a lot more of. These occur in patients with zollinger ellison syndrome and MEN1, and I'll show you some pictures in a few moments. The type 3 sporadic uh, gastric carcinoids can also be seen in practice. These are the ones that are going to occur within 
fairly normal gastric folds, and they're just going to appear out of nowhere. You're going to biopsy them, and it's going to come back as a carcinoid. In the absence of atrophic gastritis, we call these uh, sporadics. This is an example, an extreme case of a gastric carcinoid in a patient with zollinger elson syndrome. There's actually multiple ones uh, actually within the mucosa. This patient also had multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. You're probably not going to see many of these cases, but uh, if you can just picture one of these, uh, this would be more typical of the ones that you'll see. And of course, you do have to differentiate them from just tumors because uh, sometimes they can appear somewhat similarly as submucosal lesions. The uh, pathophysiology for the development of these carcinoid tumors in the stomach is really related to the, whether gastrin is playing a role in uh, stimulating the proliferation of the enterochromaffin-like cell to become hyperplastic. Uh, certain genetic factors, some of which are known and unknown, uh, like the MEN1 syndrome, can cause some of these hyperplastic ECL cells to become carcinoma, and that's when we see uh, gastrocarcinoids like the one I just showed you. Note that in red is uh, nidacepide, which is a gastrin receptor antagonist. It's undergoing clinical trials right now in the UK in patients with atrophic gastritis. Uh, at the National Institute of Health, it's being tested in patients with MEN1. Uh, the preliminary uh, reports, the papers that have just come out recently, have shown it to be quite effective in causing reversal of the uh, gastrocarcinoids in these patients with atrophic gastritis. So I think you'll, we'll be probably seeing this drug being used in your patients with chronic atrophic gastritis in the future. I just want to summarize because uh, you, you're more likely to see these patients in your practice. In terms of management, uh, those small tumors can be managed endoscopically by observation. Uh, the larger tumors should be all resected surgically. And in the case of patients with normal gastrin levels, uh, these are more likely to be the sporadic carcinoid patients. I would treat these much as you would any other gastric malignancy. I think these patients should all undergo an open uh, uh, resection with uh, lymph nodal dissection. So, so these should be managed surgically. So just a, a case that you're more likely to see in practice as you do more and more screening colonoscopies. Uh, at the VA, we're, we're now doing a fair number of screening colonoscopies, so we have a fair amount of these to report. These are the rectal carcinoids. Uh, these will typically occur in patients who are otherwise perfectly healthy. Uh, they're patients that are undergoing screening colonoscopy. You're going to find a small bump within the rectal mucosa. Uh, sometimes it'll have a yellowish hue or appearance to it. Oftentimes, you're just going to biopsy this, thinking that it's maybe a hyperplastic polyp or even adenomatous polyp, and uh, the pathology report comes back as, uh, a, uh, as a carcinoid. Note, if they're small, these can be resected endoscopically. Uh, as you heard earlier in the lecture, if they're near the anal sphincters, a transanal approach can be uh, done. Uh, for larger lesions, which is not that common, uh, these should be treated uh, uh, more aggressively with surgery. Now, rectal carcinoids and colonic carcinoids are two different um, situations. If you have a carcinoid that's occurring outside of the rectal area, this is like in the, usually the ascending colon or possibly even the transverse colon, uh, these should be treated very differently than rectal carcinoids. The colonic carcinoids behave much like small bowel carcinoids, and these should be managed fairly aggressively with um, imaging studies and surgical resection, as you would with a small bowel carcinoid. Uh, I just want to point out that some colonic adenocarcinomas may also have uh, neuroendocrine features within them. It changes the aggressivity of the tumor, and in a series that we're doing at the VA, uh, the presence of chromogranin A and synaptophysin within uh, adenocarcinomas that are just found on uh, endoscopic resection or surgical resections uh, is correlated with more aggressivity. They're, these patients are more likely to be metastatic. And, uh, and so I oftentimes, on the colon adenocarcinomas, if there's a suspicion of islets of neuroendocrine cells, we'll ask the pathologist to do chromogranin A staining and or uh, synaptophysin staining. Uh, probably the uh, neuroendocrine component through release of hormones and factors may stimulate the growth of the adenocarcinoma, perhaps may also cause it to become more metastatic. 
Uh, just a brief word, appendiceal carcinoids, we still see these uh, in patients uh, generally found uh, at the time of surgery. They're quite incidental in most cases. Most are small and relatively benign, and uh, they're usually treated along with the appendectomy. The, uh, last year, we, we spoke about the Indium 111 Octrea scan. This is the Octrea scan that you're ordering in your practice now. Uh, this is a, a radioactive isotope octreotide which is injected and we're able to then look at images uh, which localize quite well to the uh, uh, neuroendocrine cells because of these tumors express somatostatin receptors. So this is just an example to show how a comparison of CT, MRI, and, and Octrea scan imaging in a patient with a neuroendocrine tumor. And you could see that these, uh, the Octrea scan correlates quite well with the uh, expression of the uh, somatostatin receptors and the presence of these tumors. So as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Martin Auerbach of our nuclear medicine department is conducting a FDA trial looking at the gallium-68 uh, dotatate PET-CT imaging uh, in patients with neuroendocrine tumors. The, this isotope is different than the indium-111. It binds mainly to the type 2 and 5 somatostatin receptor. The doses are quite high, uh, but uh, the imaging is, uh, will generally localize these tumors uh, because of the uh, radioactivity that's emitted by these tumors. Here's an example on the top panel of the generator. This is the uh, generator to develop the uh, 68 gallium dotatate. And then once the isotope is made, on the bottom panel is the, uh, 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 the, the method for being able to uh, purify it prior to injection in the patient. Just as an example, in normal individuals, if you give gallium-68 dotatate, uh, it, it is uh, expressed in uh, several areas of the body, but you could see that uh, the uh, GI tract is highly represented in, in this. This is an example uh, of the dotatate scan. Uh, you can see that there's a baseline amount of, of uptake in key organs such as the liver and the kidney, uh, as well as in the bladder. Those are the ones that are lighting up on the imaging. Uh, so an example of where this has been useful is a patient, a 50 or 4 year old uh, female patient uh, that had a biopsy confirmed neuroendocrine tumor and it was a well-differentiated type of neuroendocrine tumor. However, the primary location of the tumor was unknown. So this is an example of the uh, comparison with FDG and the 68 dotatate. You can see that uh, the uptake with the dotatate scan in the liver, um, let's see if I could demonstrate it here. Uh, there's a fair amount of uptake in the liver, and also you can note that there's uptake also in the small bowel. Uh, which is, uh, corresponds to the localization uh, in that patient. So this is an example of the uptake in the uh, liver. You can see the multiple spots in the liver uh, and uh, the negative scanning with the, uh, the uh, fluorodopa scanning. So you can see on further cross-sectional imaging that in the small bowel there's a very heavy uptake uh, in the area of the terminal ileum uh, and also uh, on other studies, there were some additional metastases, but not seen on those images. So these are the small bowel carcinoids. Uh, they're oftentimes difficult to localize because they can be quite small, and that's the reason why the gallium scan is so useful. Uh, this is an example of a Givens capsule uh, showing a, a submucosal bump uh, in, somewhere in the small bowel. We can then use this uh, type of imaging and correlate it to gallium scanning to be able to pinpoint where the tumor is so that the surgeon can go in and do a complete resection of the uh, lesion and uh, hopefully achieve a cure. Uh, this is an example uh, of the metastatic small bowel carcinoid uh, with metastases to the liver uh, shown in the upper arrows. Uh, that's an example of correlating on the sagittal scanning to the cross-sectional imaging. Uh, also in the posterior lobe of the right lobe of the liver, there's uptake, which is quite yellow and bright. And in addition was an unusual area located in the left iliac uh, crest uh, that was seen both in the sagittal as well as the cross-sectional imaging. So this patient not only has metastatic disease uh, from the uh, small bowel to the liver, but also 
has a bone involvement as well, so that really upstages the disease. Another example is a seven-year-old female with a mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor that was resected in 2009. Uh, she developed pain in the right thigh, uh, and a Reese noctreotide scan was positive uh, for right thigh uptake. So the gallium scan was used to better localize, and you could see that uh, the initial uh, primary tumor, there was a recurrence at the primary site and a focus of metastasis in the right femur uh, shown in the bottom left panel. Uh, there is also an additional lesion loca located uh, in the thoracic spine area on the lower right scan. This is the aortic arch, and you can see an uptake in the th mid-thoracic region. So this shows where the dotatate scan was quite effective. So looking at the um, comparison of the octrea scan with the dotatate scan, uh, you could see that the uptake, the uh, sensitivity specificity of the combined imaging modality is really well over 90 percent compared to uh, a lower uh, percentage uh, for either the SPECT or the CT scanning. So I think this establishes this modality as, as really the state of the art uh, in 2014. Uh, one additional case study here, if, if I have time. Okay. is uh, the non-functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. This is a 60-year-old patient who was previously healthy, uh, had absolutely no symptoms, no past medical history, uh, who presented to the emergency room with acute onset of abdominal pain. And imaging was done by the emergency room doctors to evaluate the cause of the abdominal pain. So this is uh, an example of the end result of all of the workup. The patient was noted to have multiple uh, metastases present within the liver and also a, a focus here in the uh, lumbar spine. Uh, and so this is not unusual in patients with non-functional neuroendocrine tumors. They can be all quite healthy, not know they have a problem, and yet they will come in presenting with uh, this amount of disease, which uh, you would expect a patient with this much uh, tumor involvement in the liver to be quite sick. But in patients with neuroendocrine tumors, oftentimes they're not sick at all. This patient is not going to have cirrhosis, and uh, they can be sort of, now they can decompensate from here, but, but uh, I have many patients with this amount of disease, and they're fairly functional. Um, just in terms of the uh, treatment plan, uh, we now have Affinitor, which is an mTOR inhibitor. Uh, it blocks a key component of the signal transduction pathway. I think last year I, I described where in the signal transduction pathway that occurs. Um, we uh, typically perform imaging at six-month intervals. Uh, we'll be monitoring the patient closely for uh, side effects related to Affinitor. Which is, an oral, uh, an, which is an oral chemotherapeutic drug. Um, we also have, for some of these patients with very severe disease, like the patient I just showed you that was otherwise healthy, is PRRT therapy. This is now being done at Cedars. Um, it's a part of an, uh, of an investigational new drug application to the FDA. Uh, I think at some later point, UCLA will be a site as well. But uh, the PRRT therapy is the peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. And in these patients, we're going to give fairly high dose of the dotatate, which is either the Y90, the, which is eritrium-based, or lutetium uh, to patients in a very high dose. And this will target to the, the neuroendocrine tumors that express the somatostatin receptors. And once this uh, high dose of, chem of uh, uh, radiation therapy gets to the tumor, it will uh, it will uh, destroy the tumor. Uh, it's, uh, the side effect profile is fairly low, with nausea being the primary side effect. A renal insufficiency is a concern because uh, somatostatin is normally cleared by the kidneys, so close attention needs to be made to the renal function in these patients. <clears throat> but you can see in our present study that the response rate is fairly high. Uh, the overall response is about 40%. Uh, and the uh, progression-free survival is significantly increased. Um, sorry, this is the one I'm trying to show. So you can see that the progression-free survival is, is uh, increased, and the response rate is fairly high, 
uh, for these patients. So I suspect that in time, as this becomes evaluated, that this may become uh, one method that will be treating patients in the future. Uh, I think I have about five more minutes. Just to close on, a, on a, another group of patients, which I particularly uh, like to follow. These are the patients with Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Uh, they have a gastronoma that causes a rise in gastrin, and that in turn causes a hypergastronemic associated mucosal hypertrophy, uh, parietal cell hyperplasia, and increased uh, gastric acid uh, production. And this is an example of a typical mucosa from the stomach in a patient with a Zollinger Ellison syndrome, and you can see the expansion of the parietal cell mass shown here in pink. And these patients typically will have very large gastric folds. So if you do an endoscopy and you see very large gastric folds, a fair amount of gastric juice, post duodenal ulcers, usually you're thinking about Zollinger Ellison syndrome. Um, but because patients are taking a lot of oral proton pump inhibitor therapy, they're less likely to have ulcer disease uh, and less likely to uh, uh, have a acute GI bleeding at the time of presentation, unlike maybe 15 or 20 years ago before oral PPIs were being used heavily. Uh, liver metastases really dictates the survival in these patients. Uh, you can see this is a Kaplan-Meier uh, plot uh, that uh, surgical therapy can be curative. So if the patient doesn't have met metastatic disease, surgery really is curative in these patients. So that's usually the approach. Uh, Zollinger Ellison syndrome can be thought of as uh, either one of two varieties, sporadic or those with MEN1 or multiple endocrine neoplasia, which is a, a chromosome 11 um, uh, uh, mutation. And um, the sporadic form is usually uh, these tumors are solitary. They're, they typically tend to be more often pancreatic and more often malignant, whereas the MEN1-associated tumors are more likely to be duodenal-based, smaller, and, uh, and then you can't easily cure them with surgery. And that brings up a question in terms of the management of these patients. Uh, it's, it's somewhat controversial whether surgery can be curative in patients with MEN1-associated Zollinger-Ellison syndrome because the tumors typically are multifocal uh, in these patients, as you recall from MEN1. Uh, genetics, these patients develop pituitary tumors, parathyroid adenomas, and pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So the likelihood of cure with a resection of the pancreas is uh, less likely, although it has been looked at by Tonelli and others um, in uh, looking at uh, surgical management in these patients. So I think the general thought is that if the tumors are quite large in the pancreas or there's some involvement of other uh, important vital structures, then a surgery should be contemplated. Um, however, it should be fair to tell the patient that they're more likely to have a, a recurrent type of um, a tumor sometime down the line. Because the penetrance is variable, we don't know when those tumors will occur. So it's not unlikely that I'll see an MEN1 patient with, with normal parathyroid glands, but a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, and and I'll, I might see another MEN1 patient who might have parathyroid adenomas but not have any pituitary or pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. But if you follow these patients closely over time, they're more likely to develop these tumors as they start to get a second mutation because they have a, um, an abnormal gene on one uh, chromosome that's likely over time that they're going to develop a second hit to that same uh, locus and then develop the uh, tumor. <clears throat> the, uh, so just to summarize for the, the gastric acid uh, control is the primary modality for treating Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. We can do this quite effectively now with endoscopic gastric analysis. There's uh, also the SMART pill, which has been developed. Uh, there, there was a recent paper showing that it, uh, it can be used to measure gastric acid output. Um, oral proton pump inhibitors are still the mainstay of therapy. Intravenous PPIs, of course, in the inpatient, pa in the inpatient that requires it. Uh, the imaging modalities I've added to this list, the gallium scan, which I think will eventually become the, uh, one of the diagnostic modalities of choice, and then we typically will perform serial gastrin measurements, but also chromogranin A, neuron-specific enolase, and, uh, and also ghrelin, which uh, 
Dr. Hank Wang and our group had uh, discovered is, is uh, very nicely linked to metastatic potential for these neuroendocrine tumors. So we add ghrelin to the list of hormones that is measured. It turns out that ghrelin, which is a hormone involved in appetite control, is released by neuroendocrine tumors. So it's synthesized and made by neuroendocrine tumors. So we can use it as a surrogate marker for uh, the uh, um, metastatic or progression of these patients with neuroendocrine tumors. So just to summarize uh, the last slide here, uh, the uh, management of neuroendocrine tumors. So for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, um, everything that I said last year still stays the same. We're going to be using abdominal CT MRI imaging for localizing the primary tumor as well as metastatic tumors. Uh, we're going to use the Octrea scan. It's, it's approved by, uh, it's paid, paid by the insurance companies and by Medicare. Uh, but I think that the investigational imaging test, Gallium 68, you're likely to hear more and more of this as it gets approved uh, later. Uh, then, of course, the endoscopic ultrasonography, finding the aspiration uh, with uh, um, uh, the, sort of the advanced endoscopists to do these procedures is really critical to get nice tissue that you can then make a diagnosis. Uh, gastric carcinoids, depending on the size, is going to be continued to treat be treated by endoscopy or by surgical uh, types of techniques. Rectal carcinoids, you're likely to see them in practice. I'm sure you've got each, everyone in here has probably had a couple thus far. And you're going to be likely to see more and more of these as you do more and more screening colonoscopy. So probably of all the things that you've heard here uh, by me this afternoon, that's probably going to be the one that you're going to want to know about the most. And, and these can be managed endoscopically, uh, EMR methods uh, with uh, banding uh, and, and resection uh, will be probably the mainstay of therapy. If the tumors are large, uh, I would recommend EUS and then following the, the lesions up. I'm often asked whether how, how to follow these after you've resected them. And I think, uh, you know, follow-up surveillance colonoscopy is indicated. And then small bowel uh, carcinoids, um, things haven't really changed except for the development of the gallium scan. And I think those, the mainstay of therapy is going to be surgical resection. I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you for your attention.